I think I was 14 uh, years old. I was in the Catholic seminary up in Massachusetts. I was studying to be a priest. And this book was on our summer reading list, Contiki by Thor Heyerdahl. And uh, it's pronounced Tor. Tor, I'm sorry, Tor. And anyway, there were a lot of books on that list that I did not read. I just wasn't interested. But when I got into this book, I started reading this book. I was fascinated for a lot of reasons, and not one of those had anything to do with ham radio. But ham radio played a really big part in this expedition. This, this expedition took place in 1947, right after the uh, Second World War. Tor Heyerdahl, I'm glad you told me that because I didn't. Uh, he was an uh, ethnologist, studied cultures, and an explorer, and an adventurer. He had this idea since the beginning of World War II that the people that, that um, populated many of the islands in the South Pacific came from South America. And that one of the reasons why he thought that was that they have found many things in these, uh, on these islands, um, sweet potatoes for, for one, that they believe came from here. Uh, the Incas in Peru built rafts and uh, sailed up and down, did a lot of fishing, did a lot of movement in that area. And so he had the idea that he was going to try to prove his theory that the people from Peru and from that area populated these islands. A lot of the other people that were studying the same thing thought that they had come from the west rather than the east. So he went to the Explorers Club in New York. He knew a lot of people. and he pitched this idea. He was trying to raise money. He went to National Geographic. He went to a number of people that he knew that had money. And basically what he wanted to do was he wanted to build a raft exactly the same way the Incas did. He didn't want to use any modern technology to build it. And to do that, he had to go, he and his group had to go to Ecuador to get the balsa logs. The, 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 uh, why don't you go to a picture of the raft? The, there's the raft, and that's the raft as the Incas built it. That's the raft almost exactly the same way that uh, Heyerdahl and his group built. Uh, you can go to, go to another one, there's a picture of it. That's the raft, that's the actual raft. So they went to Ecuador. <laughs> What's that? Wet, what's called wet sailing. Yes, <laughs> wet sailing. When they went to Ecuador uh, to get the logs, it was the rainy season. And they had a lot of difficulties just getting to the area where balsa was found. They got to the area, and now the problem was they had to cut these trees down and somehow, go back to the map again, somehow they had to get those logs from here, almost a thousand miles down to a port called Caleo in Peru, where the, uh, the Navy was going to allow them to actually put this raft together. These guys were really, really adventurous and really smart. And, and what they ended up doing was they cut the logs. They put them in a river right here, all the way out to the Atlantic. They bound them together, together with hemp, which is hemp was what they used to put the raft together. That was one of the things they actually tied the raft logs together with. And they sailed down with two rafts all the way from here to there. Now, that alone was quite a feat. So they get to the port, they start building this raft. They used balsa, they used hemp, they used bamboo and banana leaves. That's how this raft was built. The only thing that they did do, which wasn't exactly the way the Incas would have built it, is they actually had a canvas sail on this, boat, on this, this raft. Um, I want to read you something that they... <laughs> They, so they're putting this thing together, and I'll pass this book around after a while. When the raft began to take shape and it lay there among the warships, golden and fresh with ripe bamboo and green leaves, the minister of marine himself came down to inspect us. We were immediately proud of the vessel as she lay there, a brave little reminder of Inca times among threatening warships. But the minister of marine was utter, utterly horrified by what he saw. I was summoned to the naval office to sign a paper freeing the Navy from all responsibility for what we'd built in the harbor. And basically what they were told by Navy people, by engineers, by architects, by people that came down to see it, 
you will last two weeks on the Pacific Ocean and you'll die. First of all, these balsa logs are never going to last above water. They're eventually going to get waterlogged and they're going to sink and you're all going to be drowned. But, but beyond that, there wasn't one person in the crew of six that was a sailor. So these guys were all landlubbers who decided, they got together and they decided, yeah, I'm going to try this. I want to do this. I want to be a part of this. Real adventurers. And I'll tell you about these crew members. Heyerdahl himself, obviously, was the originator of the thought. Herman Watzinger was an engineer. Can you go to that picture of the... All right. Herman Watzinger was the engineer, and he did a lot of their weather data collecting during the... During the, uh, the Thrift expedition. Eric Hesselberg was their navigator. He was a painter. And he was the person who painted the picture of Kantiki on the sail. Newt Haugland was one of the two radio operators, and Newt and Torsten Raby were both, they were both in the Norwegian army in World War II. They both went behind enemy lines with radios. And they both, one of them helped sabotage the heavy water plant that the Germans had that we, they were using to try to build their, their, the first nuclear weapon. And so these two guys, although they weren't ham radio people, they had some expertise in one of the radios I'm going to show you that they used on this expedition. Um, Bengt Danielson was the only non-Norwegian. He was a Swede. And he spoke Spanish, so he was very helpful to them in, in putting this whole thing together. He was their steward and their cook, and he rationed their water. They brought 275 gallons of water in tins, and the water eventually went bad. So that was the crew. The raft, as I said, was 40, it was 45 feet long, 18 feet wide, and the balsa was lashed with lengths of hemp. The floor was made of bamboo strands along with the logs. The cabin was 21 feet, and it was made with a banana leaf roof. Now, the thing to keep in mind about this, and you'll see later on when we get into the, the part about when they're out in the ocean, this raft went through some of the worst possible weather on the face of the earth in their 4,300-mile trip, and it didn't sink, and it didn't blow apart, and these guys didn't die. Now that, to me, is one of the most amazing things about this, this whole thing. Now let's get to the radios. Um, their call sign was LI2B. They had three watertight radio transmitters, one for 40 and 20 meters, one for 10 meters, and one for 6 meters. I was talking with Hal Dale about this a week or two ago, and he looked up the sunspot situation in 47. It was one of the best cycles ever. So for 10 meters, it was perfect for, you know, communicating around the world. Each of the radios was made with two E30 vacuum tubes. Does anybody know what those are? They provided 10 watts of output, of RF output. They carried a backup of a German, go to the pictures of the radios. They, they carried a backup of a German Mark V transceiver. That's the NC173, but yeah, that one there. This was a radio that was used, probably used by these guys when they were dropped behind enemy lines in World War II. That was one of the types of radios they carried aboard their raft. They had a backup of a German Mark V transceiver, originally recreated by the Germans in 1942. They also carried, go to that yellow. They carried this one here, which was an emergency set, which was used a lot in World War II. It's called a Gibson Girl type radio, and it was used to transmit uh, emergency Morse code in the event of a problem. They had a couple of those as well. They had dry batteries and a hand crank generator. Show that hand crank generator. Look at this hand crank. They had this on board. So when all else failed as far as the batteries were concerned, because the batteries had a lot of problems because there was salt water constantly coming through the raft and over the raft, and just humidity and moisture in general wreaked havoc with all of their uh, electrical. But they had this, and this was a lifesaver. They used both voice and CW. And for the first 22 days of their trip, the only communication they had was with a Peruvian naval school where they had left. 
And at last, on May 20th at 9.44 Pacific time, they got a hold of a guy, Harold Kempel, in Los Angeles, and they began to communicate with him, and he would transmit their information to the uh, Norwegian Embassy in Washington. By mid-June, now they started in April, April 27th, and by mid-June, they had worked a number of stations, and go back to that, the map again. And if you, if you look at this, they, they were being carried along by the Humboldt Current. That comes all the way from the Antarctic. The Humboldt Current and, and the winds that prevailed from this, they generally in this direction, were what carried them along the way. Their average speed was 1.7 miles an hour. When they got about this far, they were, the, the thing that they were really concerned about at the beginning was the Galapagos. I can't see where the Galapagos, oh, okay, the Galapagos right here. If the current carried them, it goes in two different directions. If the current carried them too close to the Galapagos, they would have, they would have been killed right here. Luckily, they made this turn, and once they got to about here, it was really smooth sailing. From there on, they were carried right to where they wanted to go with very little effort. They had a um, steering oar that was 24 feet, I think it was. And at the beginning of their trip, because these guys weren't sailors, they were having a heck of a time trying to keep the oar because the ocean was just incredibly tough to navigate in with this kind of a, a raft because these guys weren't sailors. <coughs> and after a while, they learned just uh, the right way to keep the sail full and the oar in such a way that they hardly had to use any effort to, to keep going the way they were going. I'll tell you a quick story. About 15 years ago, a friend of mine uh, who was a deep sea fisherman invited me to go fishing with him off of St. Mary's in Savannah. I'd never been on the ocean. So he had a 32 foot fishing boat that had a little pilot's house in it. So he's standing there directing this thing and the only other seating was an ice chest with ropes across, the, across this boat. So I sat there the whole day. We were going out fishing. We went out 18 miles into the ocean, and I was scared to death. And at 18 miles, he drops anchor, and he says, we're going to chum. I didn't know what he was talking about. So what we were doing is we were catching smaller fish that we were going to use when we went farther out, which scared me even more, to get the big fish. We caught so many fish that were like this big, and we kept cutting them up and put, putting them in, in this uh, ice chest. We went out 60 miles into the ocean. Now, this was on a clear, sunny day. When we got out 60 miles in the ocean in a 32-foot fishing boat, this boat was going like this. It would go up on a wave, and when I looked out like this, there'd be a hole. It looked like a hole, and then the thing would come down boom, like this, and then go back up on the next wave and go back down. And by the end of the day, I was a dead man. So I want you to think about this when you think about the way they made this raft. And one of the amazing things about this Inca raft was because of the way it was made, anytime water came over the, over the raft, it went through. So you don't have a danger of sinking when the water is just going to keep going through. And what they found out was it didn't matter how big the waves were, and the waves were huge in that part of the Pacific at times. This raft would go up on a wave and come down on the wave and just keep bobbing. It never turned over. They never had a problem with it. The, the only real danger was hanging on for dear life. And I'm telling you right now, when I think about that time that I was out 60 miles with my friend fishing and I was hanging on a rope for hours, that's exactly the way I felt. I cannot imagine what these guys went through to, you know, during that trip. This was 101 days, 4,300 miles. When they um, got to the South Pacific, so after about 90 days, they started to see birds. And when you see birds after you've been out in the ocean this far, because there's really nothing. And of course, this is 1947, so there were very, very few ships. They didn't see anything out here. When they got close enough to the islands, they started to see birds. And the closer they got to any kind of land, the more birds. So they knew they were headed in the right direction. 
The problem then was that there are, there are reefs all over the place and the reefs were the things that terrified them most because as they were going this way toward the islands, their raft would be pulled as they got closer to land sideways and they had a heck of a time just trying to keep far enough away until they, they, they saw land, they saw an island, they thought they were going to be able to get to the island and for two or three days they kept seeing this thing and then they realized that there was no opening in the reef. And these reefs are terrible. I mean, they're sharp and they're jagged and they stick up out of the water sometimes, but sometimes you can't even see them. So they had to keep sailing along these reefs, along the edge of these reefs, and they passed island after island after island until they finally came to this little tiny island, which is the one we will show you right here. All right, right there. It's R-A-O-R-I-A. -R -R I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. And they traveled along and traveled along and finally found what they thought was an opening in the reef, only to find out as they got closer to it, they were going up on the reef. And the Contiki, you can go back a picture or two there, ended up on the reef outside the island. It, it, oddly enough, that's what happened to the Contiki but it didn't, it wasn't destroyed and eventually they got this thing into shore. So anyway, so they get off this reef and then they had, to, they had to go and get to shore, which was a very dangerous thing. This is them. And when they got to shore, they had to keep going back out to the raft to get radio parts because they, they had to contact people within a certain period of time. Otherwise, they would think, the people that were listening for them, would think, well, they're, they're dead or something's happened. And so they went back out and they got, some, they got some of the radios. Go up to that last picture there. This is them on the island. When they finally got the radio parts, and that's their generator, uh, they had to dry everything out and it took a long time to do it. They finally contacted a guy in the States and they were sending him a message. Basically, the message is, this is us, we're safe, we're on the island, all is well, all right? So they finally contact this guy, and the guy, and they send him the message, and the guy asks them where they are, and they tell him, and he doesn't believe them. He thinks it's his neighbor at one street over who's playing games with him. And these guys kept sending the message and sending the message and sending the message, and finally, the guy in L.A. that they had been communicating with early on and along the way says, if all is well, what's the problem? And they realized that he heard them, so they started communicating with them. And that's how they finally got uh, found by a schooner that came and actually took them off the island. This, to me, is one of the reasons why I'm in ham radio. This kind of stuff, this, this to me, is it makes this hobby exciting when you think about like DXing and when you think about the things that people still do and the places that people go on this planet and and the way that we can communicate using ham radio the way that ham radio can be used in situations where people are in danger there's all kinds of reasons why you know when we talk about how difficult it is to to get kids interested in this hobby and I think to myself Show them stuff like this and, and show them that this is not a dying form of technology. It's not a dying hobby as far as I'm concerned. It's just something that I think we have to take a different approach to show people. It is the most fascinating thing I think I've ever done in my life. You know, I sat with these guys doing CW the other day on field day. One time in that whole day that I sat there, because I was trying to, my, my goal that day was, I'm trying to learn, and I still don't know CW. So I'm trying to listen to figure out what a letter is or what a number is. One time in the whole day, I wrote one down, and it just came to me as I heard it. 
and it was a call sign, and it was correct one time. And I thought to myself, well, there's hope for this old guy, you know. But, but to me, this is the, 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 whatever your mode of communication is in ham radio, and there's so many, I think that this is something, I know I, I'm trying to get this guy interested. You know, he's one of my many children, and he pays attention because he's a science guy. But I'm trying to figure out how I can spend my time, first of all, learning this stuff and getting better at it so I can do this more. But also, how I can kind of get to these guys. You know, I think about when I was young, and I think about how much I didn't pay attention to my father. My father was a scientist. He was a chemist. And he used to come home from work at night and sit at the table and talk science to us. And I would sit there and I'd be like, oh, God, you know, waiting to go outside and play. And when I think about it now, with him, he's my scientist. He's named after my father. He's my scientist. How do we get people like you, how do we get young people to realize this is something worth paying attention to, this hobby? That's my goal. Anyway, thanks for listening.